This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 16 of season 3 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, April 16, 1910. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1910. Uh, the the um, issue b- begins with the Westford Center's section. Miss Alice Howard enjoyed a recent brief vacation from her library duty- duties at Cotuit at her home at the west borders of the town. Reverend Mr. Wallace was obliged to be out of town Tuesday and was detained from reaching home until after the appointed hour for the weekly prayer meeting, and in his absence, Mrs. Wallace conducted the service most acceptably. The new Soldier's Monument has been put in place on the nicely graded triangle at the west end of the common. It has been boxed and veiled awaiting the dedicatory services Memorial Day when an an especial program will take place. This, of course, is what we know as the Civil War Monument on that little triangle at the end of uh, Hildra Street where it meets Boston Road. The choice of a new superintendent of schools for this district to succeed Mr. Weber is Frank H. Hill of Norwood. Mr. and Mrs. Weber have made many friends in our town and take with them many good wishes to a new environment. The next section is the Tadmuck Club, the uh, local ladies club of Westford. The meeting of the Tadmuck Club Tuesday afternoon in Liberty Hall called out a good representation of the membership. The subject of the afternoon was a paper on tuberculosis by Cyril A. Blaney, M.D. He was one of uh, the Westford Town doctors. The subject was most clearly and practically presented. Many facts concerning this great white plague of the human race, which is recorded from earliest times, afflicting rich and young, were given. Its avoidance and prevention, a conscientious care by those with the disease against its spread, right hygienic conditions in our homes and public gathering places were among the points most sensibly treated. This is the first time Dr. Blaney has assisted in the club programs, and his talk Tuesday afternoon was much appreciated. Miss Martha Taylor prefaced the program with two readings that, in a way, harmonized with the subject redolent of fresh air and the great out of doors. Henry Van Dyke's beautiful, uh, quote, God of the open air, end quote, and Rudyard Kipling's, quote, call of the red gods, end quote. The program for the next afternoon has been changed. It has to. Ha- it was to have been China and Old Pottery by Mrs. Clarissa Sampson of West Medford, but owing to the illness of the speaker, Mrs. Sarah Swan Griffin has been secured to give a lecture on Emerson. Mrs. Griffin is a speaker of experience and ability, and the members may expect a treat. At this meeting, the election of officers will take place, and a nominating committee was appointed by the president, consisting of Mrs. Bailey, Mrs. Wheeler, and Mrs. Smith, Lawrence, and Atwood. The next section is called Appointment. The selectmen's meeting, Saturday evening, several appointments were made as follows. David L. Grieg was granted a license as undertaker, Alex Fisher, slaughterhouse license, Charles H. Bignell, weigher of coal, George F. Millis, Millis, caretaker of the monument and grounds, A.I. Bignell, caretaker of the common, David Grieg, deputy forest warden. The following were appointed special police to serve without pay. Alonzo Sutherland for Center Village, Fred A. Sweat for the Abbott Worsted Company, Forge Village, Ernest H. Dane for the north part of town, fire engineers Captain Sherman H. Fletcher, Albert R. Schott, and John Edwards, driver of horses, David L. Grieg. I'm not sure what the driver of horses did, actually. The contract for repairing the streets at the center of the town, for which $3,000 was appropriated at the last town meeting, was awarded to H.H. Tarbell of Lowell. Workmen are to begin work next week on the new park and playground. 
Next section is the Grange. At the last meeting of the Grange, degree work was the order of the evening. First and second degrees were conferred by the regular officers upon the following candidates, Miss Bertha Norris, Miss Edith Lawrence, Miss Mabel Robinson, Mr. and Mrs. Pearlie E. Wright, Mrs. Lambert, James Hartford, and John O'Brien. Reverend and Mrs. David Wallace also presented applications by DeMitt. The committee appointed to prepare an historical sketch to be placed in the copper box under the new soldier's monument reported that this duty had been attended to. The following brief but comprehensive copy of the document was read by the secretary. Westford Grange was instituted by Leonard W. Wheeler and William L. Woods. A preliminary meeting was held at the home of Mrs. Winthrop F. Wheeler, February 27, 1895, with a gathering of 28 or more. March 6th, a meeting was held in the vestry to organize the Grange by Deputy Frank H. Steve Stevens of Lowell, I'm sorry, of Stowe, assisted by his son. March 21st, another meeting was held, and Mr. Stevens, assisted by Mrs. Calvin Howard, installed the following officers. J. Willard Fletcher, Master, Alvin G. Poley, Overseer, Samuel Taylor, cha Chaplain, Mrs. Daisy Shaw Merritt, Lecturer, Houghton G. Osgood, Gatekeeper, Mrs. George Fletcher, Treasurer, Mrs. Annie Wilson, Secretary, Henry A. Bunce, Steward, Edson G. Boynton, Assistant Steward, Mrs. M. A. Roby, Lady Assistant Steward, Florence Wilson, Ceres, Mrs. H. G. Osgood, Pomona, and Mrs. Frank Hildreth, Flora. Signed by the committee, Mrs. Winthrop Wheeler, Samuel L. Taylor, and Frank C. Wright. This, with a list of charter members and a program of the current year, were enclosed. This, that all went into the copper box that's buried beneath the soldier's monument. At the business session, much routine business was transacted. Arbor Day, uh, probably the last Friday in April, w was brought to the attention of the members. Also, an excellent article on the Grange and its purposes in the current number of the New England Magazine. The next section is the About Town section. The fortnightly club is loyal and courageous and seldom has to succumb to weather conditions, such as interfere with larger organizations. Friday night last was no exception. The rain descended and the gathering assembled and the program was not dampened. On the program was readings by Mrs. Alice Lambert, Miss Stella Glenn, and Miss Lillian Wright. For solo work, Edward Gamblin entertained at all skip places on the program. The young people had a cheerful hour with college songs closing with Home Sweet Home, the greatest and the most neglected college on earth. The next meeting will be held Friday evening, April 22nd. The first black snake of the season was seen last Sunday on Main Street, hurrying northward as though he also was going to become a discoverer. Lewis Fletcher, son of Counselor Fletcher, is ill with pneumonia. At present, there are no symptoms for alarm. Dr. Wells is baiting the, the disease to leave, which is good evidence that it will abate. Next section is called Deaths. Mrs. Sarah J. Kimball, wife of Selden W. Kimball, died in Newfield, Maine, April 5th, after an illness of one year. Besides her husband, she leaves seven children, Elmer of California, Walter of Westford, Alice Alson of Newfield, Maine, M. Ada, Mary, which... Uh, it should be May, Mrs. Inez Shea, and Mrs. Effie Hennessy. There is also an aged mother-in-law over 80 years old, two sisters, and two grandchildren. Burial was in Newfield. The Kimballs will be remembered as residents of Westford for about 10 years, living at one time on the Lowell Road in the house now owned by Gasper Desile, and later on the Graniteville Road on the farm of George L. Cady. While in town, Mr. Kimball was engaged in teaming farm produce for Boston markets. This Kimball was uh, no relation to the Kimballs of Kimball Farm, I believe, who came from Littleton. Mrs. Lizzie G. Monahan, 
Monaghan died suddenly at her home in Parkerville Sunday morning. She arose early and attended to the usual housework. Her husband went to the barn, and when he returned, she was dead. She was about 50 years old and had lived in town about eight years. The funeral took place Tuesday afternoon in the little chapel of the undertaker, C.M. Young. Reverend George F. Kengott, pastor of the First Trinitarian Church, officiated. Mrs. George W. Whitney and Mrs. W.S. Goodall sang appropriate selections. Mrs. Monaghan belonged to a number of fraternal orders, delegations being present from the Daughters of Liberty, the Evening Star Lodge of Rebecca's, and the New England Order of Protection. The Daughters of Liberty had a part in the funeral services, and the Daughters of Rebecca, of Rebecca held a service at the grave. Next is the Forge Village sec section. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher started for South Dakota Thursday morning at the invitation of Bishop Johnson, where he goes to attend a memorial service. He was the pastor of St. Andrew's Church in Ayer, which was the parent church of St. Andrew's Mission in Forge Village. During his absence, services at St. Andrew's Mission will be held at 4.30 p.m. Sunday afternoons instead of the evening service. E. H. Hilliard of Groton School will occupy the pulpit. Mr. Fisher expects to return May 1st. A daughter uh, named Sarah May was born to Mr. and Mrs. James May Saturday morning, April 9th, and died Sunday morning. Burial took place in St. Catherine's Cemetery Monday. The, mil the mills here will close Saturday, April 16th until Wednesday, April 20th. Of course, that was for the uh, annual Patriots Day celebrations. Robert McArdle of Boston spent last week with his son-in-law and daughter, Mr. and Mrs. J.E. Burnett. Fred Morris of Cambridge was also their guest over Sunday. The household effects and real estate of the late George H. Prescott were sold at auction Saturday afternoon, April 9th. The real estate consisted of a seven-room cottage and barn, two acres of land with fruit trees. The price paid was $1,825. James Benoit was the purchaser. Miss Alice L. Prescott returned Monday to her school duties in Andover after the spring vacation. She entertained at her home last week Miss Elsie Anderson of North Chelmsford and Miss Olive Palm of Lowell. Mr. and Mrs. E. W. Hyde have moved to Ayer, where they will reside permanently. Mr. Hyde is employed in the Chandler uh, Planer shop. Mrs. Mary Murray moved her household effects uh, to Ayer Wednesday. Mr. and Mrs. George H. Weaver will occupy the tenement vacated by, vacated by Mrs. Murray. Charles Flanagan, employed as flagman at the railroad crossing of the Boston and Maine, left Monday for Lemonster, where he has obtained a position as painter of smoke stakes. The ladies' sewing circle will hold I bet that stakes are supposed to be smoke stacks. That makes more sense. The ladies' sewing circle will hold their annual fair and supper in Rec Recreation Hall Saturday afternoon, April 23rd. Many useful as well as ornamental articles will be on sale. Also, candy and homemade cake and ice cream. The latest reports from Mr. and Mrs. W. E. Parsons, who went west last fall, are that Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy, sister of, Mrs. of Mr. Parsons, have sold their large farm to a Catholic clergyman who is trying to form a settlement in Oregon. Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy have gone to Washington, where they will make their home. Mr. and Mrs. Parsons will join them later, and if they find the place agreeable, they will also settle there. Special rate tickets between Graniteville and Forge Village have been established by the Street Railway Company for the benefit of those who care to use them on Sundays until 3 p.m. These tickets may be purchased at the waiting room at Forge Village or at the Street Railway office at Ayer. Lowell and Fitchburg Street Railway Company, L.H. Cushing Superintendent. The next section is the Graniteville section. 
Alan Leland, a former resident of this village, but now located in Limrock, Maine, Lime Rock, Limerick, Maine, visited a friend here this week. Cameron Circle, uh, Companions of the Foresters of America, held their regular meeting in Healy's Hall on Tuesday night. Business of importance was transacted, after which a social hour was enjoyed, during which dancing was enjoyed. Mrs. Edward Lambert, an, uh, her given name is Lizzie Ann, of Ayer, with her two children, is visiting her mother, Mrs. Elizabeth Gower. The arrangements are almost completed for the play that the Graniteville Dramatic Club will give in Westford Hall April 18th. The drama is, quote, the black heifer, end quote, and promises to be the best ever given in town. Miss Annie Healy from Boston is home for a few days, which she is enjoying at the home of her parents here. The next article is about a funeral. The funeral of the late Mrs. Mary H. Willis, wife of Samuel R. Willis, took place last Saturday afternoon and was largely attended. The services were in charge of Reverend L. F. Havermail of the Methodist Episcopal Church in Graniteville. He gave a brief eulogy of the life of the deceased and his hopeful words to the bereaved family made a deep impression. Mrs. Charles H. Wright and Mrs. David L. Grieg, John Grieg, and Edson G. Boynton sang the hymns that were favorites of the deceased, It Is Well With My Soul, Lead Kindly Light, and Christian Good Night. Among those in attendance from out of town were Mr. and Mrs. W.G. Willis, Samuel, a. E. Samuel and A.E. Willis, Miss Susie Stancombe of Lowell, Mrs. Foote, Harry, and Levina Folland of Manchester, New Hampshire, Mrs. L. Joint Richard, Mrs. L. Joint Richard Joint of Lynn, Mrs. Elizabeth Stratton of Lowell. There were many beautiful floral offerings which testified in a marked degree to the high esteem in which the deceased was held. The bearers were Samuel and Albert Willis, Harry Folland, and Richard Joint, grandnephews of the deceased. Burial was in Fairview Cemetery, Westford. The last uh, section is called A Serious Accident. John Carmichael, an elderly man who resides in this village, accidentally fell at his home on Tuesday morning, breaking his right hip. Dr. Sherman was out of town, but Dr. O. V. Wells, it's Orion V. Wells of Westford, was soon summoned and the man found so badly injured that another physician was called. Dr. Metcalf of Tewksbury soon responded and it was found necessary to mis to put Mr. Carmichael, Carmichael under ether in order to operate. In the meantime, Dr. Sherman arrived and all three physicians attended the injured man. The break is a very bad one, and considering Mr. Carmichael's age, 29 years, his chances are not very good for a complete recovery. His sons, James of Lowell and John of Ford's Village, were sent for and were soon with their father, and every care is being given to alleviate the injured man's suffering. Mr. Carmichael suffered the partial loss of an arm several years ago, and this accident, which is, which is on the same side, makes the present trouble doubly severe. Mr. Carmichael is well and favorably known here and has many friends and his many friends are hoping for a complete recovery. His daughter, Mrs. Elva Bicknell of Somerville, also arrived here as soon as she was notified of the accident and will stay at home to assist in the care of her father. That's the news in Westford for the week ending April 16th, 1910. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing techno technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.